It was dark in among the trees. Though dusk, a farmer in the neighbouring field would not have noticed the two men moving quickly through the tree line. They had run this route for fun as children and knew every step. Now men, the twins ran as if their lives depended on that knowledge. Through the darkness, the light and the half-light, they ploughed through mud and stream, jumping branches and hurdling old tree stumps. Six-foot-two frames, athletic, cast lean muscular shadows against the foliage and foray of colours that marked the ring of Gullion. They could not see or hear the men who watched them, but knew they were there. Approximately three-quarters of a mile above them, the silent rotors of the Chinook turned, lights blacked out, a chameleon camouflaged against the South Armagh sky. Bearing, demanded the skipper. Bearing turning thirty degrees north by northwest. Speed, speed one four kilometres per hour, sir. Still turning, the navigator strained. We're losing them, skip. Stay with them, man, as the skipper leaned over the shoulder of the experienced radar operator. Now, corporal, switch to thermal. The thermal tracking device locked on. It could distinguish between animal and man up to a range of two miles. A favoured toy of the British Army on scanning the rabbit warren of border paths, roads and treks that separated South Armagh in the north and the neighbouring county Louth in the Irish Republic. The thermal tracker carried a penalty, however, as its transmit signal could also be used to lock surface-to-air missiles to the non-visible helicopters if the signal was allowed to emit for more than 90 seconds at a burst. The twins, with home in sight, were now sprinting. Speed accelerating one eight kilometres per hour. The skipper watched the men on the monitor intensely, their red outlines now burning white light with increased work and heart rate and subsequent rise in body temperatures. Sixty seconds at three, two, one, mark, the thermal operator reported. Twenty to thermal shutdown. There was a pause. The skipper frowned as he studied the monitor, failing to acknowledge the operator's warning. Ten seconds, sir. Protocol insisted on mandatory shutdown at 80 seconds, and as the timer ran out, the crew looked nervously at the skipper. Indifferently, he held his palm out to silence their reminders. I've seen enough. Shut it down. He cursed and whispered to himself, We'll never catch him at this rate. The pilot radioed base to clear for landing. X-ray Mike Golf, this is Hotel Charlie, 830 Sierra Oscar. Receiving Hotel Charlie, came the reply from the tower. Requesting Lima Zulu, the radio name for the LZ, a name popularised by the American Marine pilots in Vietnam for the landing zone. Lima Zulu's green and lit up, came the clearance from the XMG tower, as the temporary lights guided the bird to its nesting place. You all right, boys? Yes, ma, said Connor Mack, as Sean laughingly pushed him through the scullery door of the farmhouse. He had left him in his wake the last fifty metres from home. God bless, she said, crossing her two sons in the name of the Holy Trinity. Glad to see his home safe. She knew where they'd been, but didn't make any reference or show any concern for what they'd been doing. Her concern, or worry, would be reserved for the silent thought and bidding after her nightly rosary, a tradition that all the family gathered to take part in. The twins, however, were more concerned with another family tradition that passed down from their grandfather to father, and now them. They passed through the kitchen to the sound of their father coughing uncontrollably. Severe asthma induced by smoke inhalation, a souvenir of his brief interment in Long Kesh during the fire of 1974. Sean helped to clear his lungs with a welcome clap to the back as he walked past. He shook his head. To see his father like this, glancing to the wall adorned with medals and old football pictures of his fitter father from days with the Rangers. Joe O'Malley didn't raise an eyebrow as he left the pub on Ophir Square. The wind lifted and the sky filled with air burling and turning in five directions as the black and green gunship descended not twenty metres from him. He flinched silently 
steadying himself, then reached for his leg. His knee had been badly hit some decade earlier while carrying out his craft, but his active service days were now over, and he now used his depth of knowledge and experience to guide those under his charge. In 72 hours, his charges will be put to their biggest test. Well known and respected in the village, he returned nods of, Evening, Mr O'Malley, as he set off to the parochial house with final preparations in mind, rehearsing what he would say to the men waiting there for him. Giant letters rose up to greet the bird from fifty feet below. Welcome to XMG, army code name for Cross McGlen. The rotors decelerated, and the descending men touched the ground, as was tradition on returning to terra firma. The skipper, formerly known as Captain John O'Neill, had hit the ground well before the Chinook's landing gear. He walked at pace along the path from the helipad, returning salutes from the duty guards. He was a long way from his hometown of Limavady, and via engineering at Oxford, where he had won blues at both rugby and rowing. At six foot three, he was suited to both passions, before embarking upon another passion, a commission from Sandhurst and then Hong Kong, Bosnia and West Berlin. Though only a wall and mortar resistant fence from his fellow countrymen, he didn't expect to be drinking Guinness with any of the locals any time soon. Skipper, you have the tapes? Major Fleming ushered him to his small but eccentrically furnished office. Please join me for a scotch before the briefing. O'Neill was always amazed at how pleasantly decorated it was, with pictures of a hunt scene and two leather chairs he insisted on bringing from some far corner of the British Empire to this modern-day army fortress, no doubt. Thank you, sir, said the skipper, but he knew what was coming. How are things looking? The men ready? Yes, sir, I hope. Hope, Captain, the Major exclaimed. You are bloody better know, sir. You know what's at stake here. You've got everyone and everything you asked for. Now I've had my battalion on my back since details of the op came through. O'Neill considered interrupting him, but knew it would be fruitless. He let Fleming finish, then headed to the briefing room. Inside, a specialist unit would be waiting for his latest planning. Sean Mack stood in front of the fire in the back room of the parochial house. Curtains had been drawn, and only a small table lamp and the light from the fire illuminated the room. Father McPartland was one of the few people who gave Joe O'Malley his christened name, almost whispering to add to the secrecy. Joseph, now I'll just be popping out to give the Eucharist to an old lady in Mullochbone. There's tea and sandwiches in the pantry for you, and Mrs O'Boyle is left for the evening. The priest left the clandestine meeting. Despite his public face and opinions, he'd always privately been sympathetic to their cause perhaps a result of the particular catechism of the Christian Brothers' school he'd attended while growing up in the markets area of the Lower Ormo Road, Belfast. O'Malley quickly turned to business. Fellas, I don't have to tell you about what could happen on Sunday evening. He pointed his finger and cold eyes went from man to man, searching for any weakness or sign of second thoughts. He reminded them of their preparation, planning and training for the job in hand. He'd taken them deep across the border to County Meath to practice shooting, away from watchful eyes and surveillance units. He spoke of Cahullan and the honour of battle. He knew that not one of them had any fear of injury or personal risk. They had risked all for their cause, week in, week out. But this was the big one. Right, lads, O'Malley stood up. I want you to go over your roles one more time. He turned to Connor. You will lead the attack. Sean, I want you to review defence positions. Sean Mack illustrated with chalk and an old blackboard Father McPartland had borrowed from the adjoining primary school. O'Malley continued. This is our big chance. He didn't mean to glance at the picture of the Sacred Heart. I want these bastards taken out quickly. 